Now is a great opportunity for us to discuss how MySQL handles logging. Logging, of course, is important for most applications, especially for enterprise class applications such as DBMSs. Because as an administrator, you need to know what's happening to the server at a, any particular point in time, and perhaps even more importantly, what has happened at a given point in time. So through logging, we are able to expose what's happening or what has happened or what could potentially happen on the server. It's a window into the health of the DBMS. So let's label this section logging and we'll discuss the rules behind how MySQL takes care of logging for us. First and foremost you should know that MySQL by default maintains its log information via four logs. So note MySQL utilizes four log files by default. And we say by default because this is the default when replication is not enabled. Replication is not enabled by default, so the default states that there are four log files that we need to be concerned with and manage. Let's label or list those four log files. The first is the error log file. The error log file should always be present and this particular file is located in the data directory. In fact, by default, MySQL will place any log file that it writes into the data directory unless you direct it to place the file elsewhere by specifying an absolute path. So we should also note default directory for logs is the data directory, which generally on a Nix-based system, including Linux and Unix, is var lib mysql. So the error log file, the first file that we want to discuss, logs the following information. The startup, or the start, the run, as well as the stop of mysql, which means every time you start mysql, and when it's up and running and there's something critical that's occurred and every time you stop MySQL you'll find information in the error log file which pertains to those events so you can relate those types of events starts stops and runtime errors critical runtime errors to the error log file the second log file is the query log file the query log actually records all client connections and executed statements. So this particular file logs client connections and their executed statements. Not necessarily in the order in which they were executed on the server, but it will, for the most part, capture all of the statements executed by your user community. And as a result, you can use this file to analyze potentially troubling queries or situations that could cause delays for other users or you could even identify who is hogging or making terrible uses of your resources by examining the query log file. The default RPM binary that we're using does not enable the query log file so we'll need to turn it on and we'll show you how. The third log file is the binary log file and this particular log file manifests itself in a few ways but the default binary log file which you've seen because we've covered replication covers data changing statements and of course these are SQL statements and it's also used with replication so what you'll find in the binary log file as opposed to the query log file are only statements that could potentially change data such as updates inserts and perhaps delete statements. The binary log file really only stores or represents data changing statements or statements that could change data such, a de such as a delete statement. So that's what you'll find in the binary log file. And the fourth log file, and by no means are we done, we're going to look at the file system and examine each of these log files momentarily, is called the slow log file. The slow log file is an excellent log file, which again is not enabled by default with the RPM binary distribution that we're using. What this particular log file does for the DBA is it identifies queries that are taking too long. So let's label this as 
the file that identifies slow running queries. To be more specific, the queries that tend to be slow are queries that don't use indexes, so we should elaborate a queries that don't use indexes, which are generally unoptimized or non-optimized queries. Queries that don't use indexes, as well as queries that take longer than a variable that's set when MySQL starts, then the log slow, in this case the long query, not log slow, log slow is the file name, long query time variable, which is default, or which defaults to 10 seconds, which we'll show you momentarily. So these are your four log files, and we should mention that there's a fifth one that it's only available when replication is configured. The fifth log file that's available when replication is configured is the relay log. So the fifth file is the relay log, which as you know also has a corresponding index file. But this is used again only for replication. And as a result, since we have replication turned on, we'll look at all five log files since we do have it configured. So let's begin our studies by focusing on the error log file. So what's important about the error log file? Well, within the error log file, as mentioned, you'll see events related to start runs or start the current running as well as the stop conditions of the server. So start, stops, and runs. Let's go to the shell and navigate to varlib mysql. The default directory is the data directory, if you recall. And that error log file defaults to a name of hostname.err. In this case, the hostname is linuxcbtdb1.err. So let's list that the default file name, and this is the case pretty much for all of the files with the exception of the relay log file and the binary log file. There's slight variation, but somewhere in the file name you'll find the host name. Default file name is host underscore name dot err, or in our case, linuxcbtdb1.error. If you're interested in the type of file that this is, it's a text file. Let's execute file against linuxcbtdb1 dot err, and as you can see, it's ASCII text, which means you can use your favorite pager, such as less, to examine the contents of the file. And if you look at it from top to bottom, you'll see exactly where MySQL started. And notice that the date stamps are represented using two-digit leading years. So this particular server was started on first, that is, on the 7th of February, of course formats being YYMMDD. It was started at 1852, and you'll see any information, any errors, for example, it was the first time it started, so the IDB or IBD data file or IB data one file did not exist, so it was created. And here are some other entries. It was set to 10 megabytes, physical rights, and so forth. So you may trace through this to get a sense from the server's inception of what's occurred whenever the server started, as well as while the server's up and running, as well as when the server stops. Here's an error, for example, regarding using the socket. In this case, it's not an error, it's just a statement saying that's going to use the port 3306 for communications. And then eventually on the same day you see a shutdown. It was a normal shutdown, which means it could have been shut by using the MySQL run script, either by the system upon system shutdown or by the administrator, which would be me. Shutdown was complete and so forth. This is for the 7th of February. Then on the 8th you see the server was started again. Here's some InnoDB references, which for the most part don't apply because our table structures are based on MyISM. Here's the opening of the socket again, port 3306. Every time it opens, the port is revealed. So in the event that someone changes the port that MySQL listens to, you'll see evidence of that in the error file. And it was normally shut down and so forth. It was ended on the same day on the 8th. Then we get to the 9th. You see it's ready for connections. It came up. It's ready for connections bound to 3306. Ready for connections means two things. One, it'll accept connections on, at least within a Nix-based system, on a Unix socket. And two, it'll also accept connections on a TCP port. And again, you'll find 
anything related to starting, runtime, as well as shutdown of the server. So you should peruse this file looking for any peculiarities such as missing databases tables, inconsistent databases or tables, or any errors that are likely to be picked up by MySQL. For example, when it's running, if there are table related errors, MySQL will log that information to the error file and we'll keep scrolling. Now this file can grow pretty large which is why you want to consider rotating the file if you don't have a rotation script already defined. Usually on RPM based systems you'll find a rotation script and that script is usually located, let's quit this particular shell here that's our second slave, it's normally located in the log rotate directory and it's called MySQL. Here it is, if we examine the contents of the file you'll see that this file instructs the log rotation program on how to rotate MySQL's log files. It scans varlib MySQL, looks for MySQL d.log. Now this particular file may or may not exist, but that is how the RPM process set up the file. This is the default file that was included in the RPM that was used to set up the server. So if you need to rotate your files outside of the default, you just simply need to go in and change it. It does a rotation of the mysql.d.log file and some other options and post rotate. It runs admin to ping and so forth and it flushes the logs. But more on, on that about, or more on flushing the logs in a little bit. Let's return to our error log file. Notice you see some errors here. For example, after we enabled replication, MySQL wrote a warning to the default error file indicating that the server is a master but we do not have a default file name set for the binary log file. As a result MySQL defaulted to using the host name dash bin as a prefix but the MySQL software is warning us that in the event that the server's host name were to change then replication could be broken because the MySQL server would default to reading the new file name which would resemble the new host name dash bin. So it's just a small warning. If you have no intent of on changing your system's host name, then you can ignore the error or follow the suggestion which simply says to rectify it. Define either on the startup command line for MySQL D or in the one of the options files an option called log dash bin for binary logging and set it to a proper host name that is consistent and will always be used regardless of what the system's host name happens to be currently. So they're simply saying rather than relying upon the server deriving a name or concatenating a name based on what it derived from the host name and a suffix of dash bin, explicitly tell it what name to use. Super. So the error file is in this directory, the data directory, and so are all of the other files, and it can grow very largely or very to a great size and consume most of your storage unless you have a log rotation script running. Now it's obvious our current log rotation script will not handle this error file. And let's say, for example, it's up and running and it's too big, you could execute a flush logs from within MySQL to cause this particular file to be zeroed out so let's just list it Main, you can to maintain the log file execute flush and it's case insensitive logs from within mysql terminal monitor or execute MySQL admin followed by flush dash logs and this will cause logs to be flushed and you'll have access to the new files. Super. So that's a little bit about the error file. Again, the error file can be changed to a different name so it's not based on the host name but what it means is we need to modify and we'll do it now. Let's modify the etc my.cnf file and in the section beneath MySQLD we'll define log and in this case log error and we'll set it to a name which is based on the host name Linux CBT DB1 so it'll be the same name when the server restarts and ditto for the other log files but again this avoids any concatenation based on deriving the log files name from the host name 
and in the case of binary logs it makes it much more consistent and avoids the situation where you end up reading from a new log file name because the host name has changed. So the error file is going to consist of entries related to starting, stopping, and runtime of MySQL. Next we discuss the query log, the binary log, and the slow log. So we've made our directive change for the error log file. Let's go ahead and restart MySQL by executing an RC MySQL stop and then an RC MySQL start. Again, the RC scripts are specific to SUSE, SUSE Linux that is. If you're within a, another distribution, just use the scripts provided by the distribution of choice. So let's take a look at this directory, and you'll notice that we have a new error file, or an error file with the same name, linuxcbtdb1.err. But more importantly, if we execute a MySQL D verbose, followed by help, and pipe to less, we'll eventually see where the log file is defined. We can even pipe it to grep and look specifically for log to see entries related to log. And we'll scroll up, you'll see the log error directive shortly, and here it is. Log error is set to linuxcbtdb1 because we specified as such in the my.cnf file. So now it's no longer dependent upon deriving the host name from the local system. And again, we can tail this particular file, linuxcbtdb1.err, it's a text file, to see what has been written to it since its recent start. And we can compare it to the current date, so 1556 would include MySQL just starting up. Now notice it says no argument was provided for log bin. This is the same error related to replication, and we're about to talk about the binary log file after we talk about the query log file. So we'll rectify this problem soon enough. Notice also that the file is the same file. If we take a look at linuxcbtdb1.err, it still contains entries from the 7th of February. So it hasn't been overwritten, but it could be flushed if we ran MySQL admin. Let's go ahead and try that, followed by flush logs. Now when you execute MySQL admin, you do need to authenticate. So you can't simply just say flush logs because any user who gains access to the system could compromise your logs, and logs are very important. So we'll need to prompt for password or specify it on the command line and then flush the logs. An echo of the exit status reveals that it was successful. So now let's take a look at the directory. You'll see that there's a new zero file, linuxcbtdb1.err, but also notice we haven't lost any information. The old linuxcbtdb1.err file has been renamed to the same prefix dash old so the events are still there for processing or for analysis by the DBA so that's another thing to know let's just list when or flushing the error log file will cause MySQL to rename the old file to the same prefix which is usually host underscore name dot err dash a new suffix of old so it'll rename it to the same prefix dash old and we'll just simply say ie linuxcbt db1 dot err dash old and we'll take a look at it there it is so err-old, this is the new name. So enough about the error log file. You know when to go and look at this particular file. It's when you want to see events pertaining to starting, running, and stopping the server. And you know that all of the entries are prefixed with a timestamp with a two-year or two-digit leading year. So that's another note. Entries are prefixed with a two-digit year. But again, this is all subject to change, so we don't want to dwell on it. If it does change to four digits, then so be it, and you'll update yourself on that information if and when that's the case. But that's currently the case, that it's based on a two-digit year. So now we want to talk about the query log, which isn't turned on by default. Let's set up a section calling it query log and describe what the query log will do for us. The query log is mentioned 
logs client connections and their executed statements. It's a great log for troubleshooting performance issues when many users or users are using the system and complaining about the performance of the server. So use it to troubleshoot performance issues. But you can use it for other things. All queries or all executed statements will be logged to this particular file. This file reflects all statements. Unlike the binary log file which reflects only changing or data changing statements, this file will reflect data changing statements as well as additional statements. So that's important to know. Its default file name, so let's list that default file name is based on the following host underscore name dot log and it can be set using you can set or alter the default file name using the following variable when we prefix any MySQL option with two dashes that means it's a variable and if you recall from our earlier studies if you simply strip the leading dashes you may specify that option directly in an options file so if we were to use for example simply log equal file this would enable us to change the file name or if you were to simply specify log without any file names then MySQL will default to the host name dot log file as its name of course but we can change it by using dash dash log equals new log file name super now this particular file let's see again it doesn't exist on the system let's lsltr star dot log you'll see it doesn't exist it's not turned on by default or enabled by default turn this option on with caution because it can create a lot of information if you have a lot of users who execute many statements it can grow pretty big pretty fast but again it's used for troubleshooting so what we're going to do is turn on that option right now by editing the options file let's pico etc my.cnf and beneath the mysql d section will simply just turn on log by using log that's all we have to specify unless you want a specific name we'll then execute an rc mysql restart that is and this will restart the server and you'll see the new log file which is the query log file momentarily there's the file linuxcbtdb1.log and if we execute a file against it you'll see that this particular file is ASCII text so that means we can take a quick look at it and you'll see that it contains basic information no queries have been written yet you'll see shortly though when we go in in a separate window and execute queries that the server will write it to it here we still have a session but we'll quit it because it's not on the local host it will kill all sessions return to the local system and then log back in and then execute some queries let's go ahead and do a use HR the database that we know that's there and then after we've used HR we're gonna execute some selects now before even executing any selects let's take a look at what's been written to the file thus far if you recall it was almost blank a few seconds ago Here's the file, 139 bytes. Let's lsltr again, but this time just the file linuxcbtdb1.log. And you'll see it's already grown to about 1,200 bytes, which is still small, but again, we're only one user, and we haven't really done much other than connect it to the server and executed a use HR. So let's see what's in this file to cause it to have grown 1,200 times, or roughly 1,000 times the size or in this case a little over 600 times the size from 139 to 1200 here's all the information pertaining our recent connection we connected as root a query select user was ran, run and we didn't run this directly but by virtue of setting the prompt it caused a select user to run so this affected a select user or the definition of the prompt if you notice in this window we have a prompt defined which contains username as well as host name and the actual creation of the prompt is as a result of running certain queries such as select user we can literally run this query you'll see it returns just root or select database for example let's copy it and we'll execute it and you'll see it returns just the username 
and then the prompt relies upon it for presenting the prompt. Here's a query, the initial database, HR, show databases, show tables, show field lists, and so forth. Now let's look at the file again, and you'll see the most recent query run, of course with a prefix of a timestamp with a two-digit leading year, select user, the most recent command. Now we don't need to use less, let's just run tail, and tail will, with watch, will continuously update this particular file to the screen for us. So in this window, we'll leave it open and then we'll return here and then do a show tables. After show tables will return, and you'll see show tables. Let's go ahead and select, or in, before we select, let's describe employees, and you'll see describe employees. Let's then go ahead and select star from employees, and I think you get the picture. Each query will be written verbatim to the query.log file, which means it can grow tremendously large. But it's a great way to troubleshoot. And notice also, if we take a look at the header of this file, because right now we're tailing it, let's less Linux cbtdb1.log, there's a column that takes that actually houses the connection ID. So the connection ID that ran this recent request is connection ID number one. If we execute a show process list, you'll see the various processes, including ours, which is number one and the two for replication, of course. Super. So we know a little bit about the query log file. We know it's a text file. We know that we can influence the name. And we also know that it's not enabled by default. We have to turn it on. And it's not enabled because it comes at a performance hit. And again, this particular log file can be flushed using MySQL admin. So let's go ahead. This time, let's do flush logs from within MySQL, since we ran MySQL admin before. We'll flush logs. It does it very quickly. And from the shell, what you'll notice is that the Linux CBT db1.log file is still at size, but the error file has been flushed. Let's do a tail of Linux CBT db1.log and you'll see it contains everything that we've done including the flush logs and you'll see that the standard log file so forth and so on so in other words it flushed the log file it's ready to write new information so the query.log file or the query log file that is which defaults to a host name dot log file name stores all queries including update deletes and information that you'll find in the binary log file so now let's discuss that next log file, the binary log file. The binary log file is stored in a format that's binary, which means it's written quicker than ASCII text-based file names, or ASCII text-based files, that is. And as a result, it's more efficient and less likely to lose information when the system is under stress. The binary log file contains only data-changing statements and it's also used with replication. That you know because we listed it above. So we said this file contains data changing statements and it's used with replication and we currently have it defined so there's no need for us to do anything else other than look at what's currently there. We'll take a look and it's a file name with prefix with the host name dash bin. So we'll look for Linux CBT DB1 dash bin star and these are the binary log files. As we told you during the replication section MySQL handles incrementing the numeric value for each of the log files, usually with the highest numeric value being the current log file that's in use. Here you can see that the most or the highest is 6, so this is the file that's likely to be used. The index file tells MySQL which of these log files is considered the current binary log file. A file against Linux CBT DB1 bin star will reveal that they're considered to be replication log files with the exception of the index file. So let's cat this in the index file without the colon and you'll see it contains the different file names with the last value being the current file. But again, you can't simply look at the binary log file using an ASCII based utility such as less or a pager you need a special utility to look at it and there is a special utility I mean, for example if we are just simply go ahead and just try to look at Linux CBT DB1 bin let's go with the recent version 006 you'll see 
it prints gibberish to the screen with only slight traces of queries in between. So to view the contents of the file, we need to use a separate utility. There's a utility called MySQL bin log, and that utility allows you to read the file. A which MySQL bin log reveals that it's in user bin, and an RPM query file of user bin MySQL bin log reveals that it's a part of the client package that we installed earlier on in our studies. So let's execute a MySQL bin log against the log file. We'll go with Linux CBTDB1 bin 0006, which really contains nothing much. And you'll see the binary has been converted to ASCII text, and it shows a new session. The server was flushed, but no other useful statements because all we've done since the server's been up is flush. We haven't changed any data, which is why you don't see anything there. So we'd have to look at one of the earlier files in LSLTR Linux CBTDB1 bin star will reveal larger earlier files such as file number two. So let's look at this file. MySQL bin log followed by this file name will reveal all of the data changing queries that were executed earlier. Here they are. We granted access, which is data changing. Let's see what else we did as one of the queries. Here's a delete, which also executed. Here's a drop statement. All of them being prefixed again by a two digit year, followed by the remainder of the date and timestamp information. So it is sequential. Here's an insert statement and so forth. You'll only find statements that are data changing statements and again notice that all of the information is in clear text which means you want to protect the files using appropriate permissions so don't give out your MySQL password and guard your root account password because the queries can be revealed rather easily so ideally what you want to do is ensure that all of your slave servers are up to date have been replicated and then use your log rotation script frequently to flush the log file so you can get rid of those entries because if anyone gains access to the system they're able to then look at the queries that have been run so the binary log file is used to store so it's used to store data changing statements and also used for replication that's these are the primary uses of the file and its default file name is of course host underscore name dash bin dot and the remainder of the file name which has the numeric value and here it is so we'll just specify that there is a numeric value ie Linux CBT DB1 bin and a numeric value. So that's a little bit about the binary log file and we use MySQL bin so use MySQL bin log to read or to process we should say the binary log file. Now MySQL bin log supports many other options. For example you know that the file with the 000 or the 2 extension, 2 suffix contains statements with various times. Let's take a brief look at it again and we'll pipe it to less so that we can see the earlier statements. Here are statements from the 19th which is today from 13 from 1258, 1344, 1348 and so forth. 1349, 1410 so anywhere from anywhere after 12 to almost 4 p.m. Well if you simply execute a MySQL bin log and pipe its help options to less you'll see that it supports other useful features such as the ability to return only output or only log entries from a certain start date time to a certain stop date time which means we can zero in on specific events in the event that your binary log file is considerably large so we can instruct it to give us a certain start date time and a certain stop date time or either or if you get instructed to use a certain start date time then it starts at that particular location and will show all entries or all events through the end of the file. Additionally we can specify a start position and a stop position. In other words the offset in the file which is what's required when programming the slave servers anyway. So so far we've discussed three out of the four log files. You know the error log is where you're gonna find start stop as well as runtime errors 
Query log logs all queries regardless of type or purpose. Binary log logs only data changing statements. And the one file less left to discuss is the slow log file. So next we discuss this file. So let's continue our log file discussion. We've talked about three of the four. Let's discuss the fourth, or really three of the five, because we did mention that replication is enabled, so we do have the intermediary log files that are processed by the slaves, which can be read using MySQL bin log. We should mention that. Before moving on to slow log, let's just mention that, for example, you won't find this file on the master server, but on the slave servers, you're going to find the intermediary file. Let's find one of our slave server instances. This is still DB1. We'll connect to Media1, for example. So we'll SSH out to, let's exit this root session, this root shell. Let's SSH as root over to Linux CBT Media1. And once we've gotten onto the box, we'll log in or change into varlib MySQL. We'll LSLTR. Here are the relay log files. These are also binary files. A file against them will tell us that, of course. We'll just look at both relay files. One is text, but it's an index file just to keep track of which relay file is the existing file, no differently than the binary log file is used on the master MySQL server. So this binary file can also be read by MySQL bin log because the binary relay file is formatted with the same format that's used for the binary log file on the master server. So in other words, it's the same format, which of course should make sense since the slave connects to the master and downloads the changes from its master binary file. So it would not make sense to use different formats. On the remote system, if we were to execute a MySQL bin log, followed by the name of the relay file, and you'll see all entries have been converted from binary to text and each are indicated by their leading date and time stamps followed by whatever data changing queries were executed so use mysql bin log to process relay logs when replications are turned replication is turned on as well as binary logs on your primary server so now we want to discuss the slow log as mentioned the fourth of five or fourth log file of the total number of log files supported identifies slow running queries. Queries that don't use indexes and queries that take longer than the long query time variable. Let's take a look at what this particular variable is set to. We did say it defaults 10 seconds. So we're going to say here that defaults to 10 seconds but then show you it by executing MySQLD. MySQLD verbose help and we'll grep the value that we have in memory and you'll see that the long query time is set to 10 so it defaults to 10 seconds we can show you more context information by using dash C after grep and perhaps two lines above and below and you'll see that the long query time can be specified on the command line but has a default value of 10 10 seconds may be considered a long time for queries to execute depending on your in, your environment so if that is the case you will want to change this particular variable to be a shorter value but the lowest value that you can set is one so we should mention here minimum value equals one for one second but it defaults to 10 seconds which means if queries are running longer than 10 seconds they will be logged to the slow log file well other important information related to the slow log file is that of course it uses a default file name of host underscore name dash slow dot log this is the default name and of course you can influence it so you'll use for example you can alter the default file name using the log slow queries variable and you'll set this equal to whatever name new file name or new log file name if you don't specify a file name of course the default will be 
host underscore name dash slow dot log. Now as mentioned, this file isn't turned on by default. If we lsltr grep slow, you'll see it doesn't exist. Again, this file can grow pretty large and should only be turned on when you're troubleshooting. If your system's optimized, you should be able to tell us such by simply running commands such as uptime on any Nix-based system. And as you can see here, the utilization is low, and it should be low even on an optimized system. But if you find that utilization is very high, for example, by running uptime or by running top, you find that MySQL's utilizing or pretty much hogging your processor, then you'll want to enable the slow log file and see which queries are taking too long. Now again, you may or may not catch values, but if you let your server run over a good period, such as a day to a week, and that would be a day to a business week of typical usage, you should be able to track which queries are underperforming. So let's turn on this particular option, the slow log file. So we'll pico etc my.cnf and once in there we're going to add the log slow queries and let it default to the default file name. So let's copy this directive and we'll pico etc my.cnf and again in the log or in the log section within the MySQL D group, we'll just specify log slow queries and then restart MySQL using RC MySQL restart. And you'll see that a new file is created, but it will not be populated with any meaningful data until queries that exceed 10 seconds or bypass indexes altogether execute. So now we have our slow log file. There it is. Let's cat its contents to see it is a text file, by the way and you'll see nothing's run yet. Same setup or a similar setup to our query log file which includes the columns time ID that's the connection ID so you can tell who connected the command that was executed in any arguments again you know that the default query log file which is just the dot log file has a similar format and lsltr start out log will confirm as such let's cat the contents of this file in fact let's less it so we see the column headers and you'll see time ID command and any arguments the arguments of course are the queries the command is the category such as whether or not it's a connection being established or a query or if it's the bind log or bin log dump program performing replication for us between the master and the slave servers so we have the slow log configured we're going to leave all of these log files configured so that throughout our studies and as we move on to PHP we'll hopefully generate queries that take too long but we could easily create a condition where we log information by altering the number of seconds that the long underscore query underscore time defaults to this is currently defaulting to 10 but if we simply set this in the mysql d section to be a different value such as one then any query that takes even a fraction of a second over one second will be logged and will capture it so again We've covered pretty much all five log files, with the four main ones being the query log, binary log, slow log, and of course, the error log file. The fifth being the relay log file, which we've covered by setting up replication. That is the file that you use, or that MySQL uses, to store whatever has been downloaded in a certain time period from the master server. These log files contain critical information and you will want to use them wisely. The default query log file should be disabled if you're not troubleshooting for many reasons. One, privacy reasons because all queries will be revealed. Not necessarily the result set but the commands that were executed, the actual query statements. And two, because if many users use the system, the file is likely to consume a tremendous amount of storage in a short amount of time unless you perform log rotation and compression on a pretty frequent basis which you certainly can it's just that it would cause a lot of interruptions in your processing and as you know you can use mysql admin followed by flush logs to effect the zeroing out of some of the log files and the flushing of the log files altogether some of the log files will be incremented with new values such as the binary log files and the text-based log files such as query log 
as well as error log will simply be renamed with a dash old extension and the new one will be set. And in some cases the log file files themselves are just zeroed out and no renaming occurs. But nonetheless, you know which files are important. There are five primary log files and on any given server if replication is disabled, which is the default, there are really four categories of log files that you're concerned about. Error log, which is always turned on. Query log, which is not turned on. Binary log, which is not defaulted or does not turn on by default or not enabled by default and the slow log file which is also not enabled by default. So really out of the four only one's t enabled by default. That's the error log file which shows us items related to starting, running, and stopping the server. Anything else is considered ancillary and considered a process or a log file that will subtract from the overall or degrade the performance of the server. So you'll want to use those options wisely. So that's a little bit about the logging. Now that we have it turned on and we waited particularly for after the replication section because we wanted to have collected enough data for us to articulate what's happening in the log files rather than looking at it from the beginning when there isn't really much data now that we've done all of this work and you see entries in them in the various log files they make much more sense and are much more obvious so as we continue our studies with MySQL you'll see more information in all of the log files and we won't disable the individual log files until later on when we're wrapping up.